It's Wednesday, it's a shocking wet, cold winter's day. In fact, I like these days. It's a great day to be in the shed. I have my bench cleaned. It's time for episode 18 of an unboxing or something out of the emergency storage shed. Time to go and have a look. Hey guys, it's Chris from the Ultimate Recycler. It's, um, it's a great day to be in the shed. I do enjoy cold winter days like this and the dogs aren't overly stressed. What a life, hey? Lounging in front of the fire. Let's go out here and have a look at what we can get out of this shed. I have not looked. Um, in fact, I do have to apologise though, two, those two buckets should not be there. I am not going to accumulate stuff here as space becomes available. Uh, they're both just simply some processed scrap that I have to put in my bins outside. And I'm not going out at the moment. It's teeming down and it's going to be to he get heavier. Um, in fact, they're forecasting a lot of rain. We still have over in that carport there, you can see the plywood door. We still have an emergency outdoor shower because our bathroom's being renovated and there'll be a video coming soon on that, on that build and the progress of the bathroom. I think I've mentioned it. It's been going on for a long time now, so we're looking forward to getting back into um, luxury as far as the bathroom goes. All right, well, we've made a little bit more progress in, on the floor. That wood saw shouldn't be there either. It will be gone shortly. Uh, Christine actually said to me, I know what you're going to do. As soon as you make room in here for a bench, you're going to put something in and pile it to the roof again. And I am definitely not. I am going to be really disciplined with this room. I'm not going to leave it empty. As I make room, I will set up some shelving, but I'm not going to pile doom boxes in here. And if you didn't see the last video on that or the mention of that, doom stands for didn't organize, only moved. Right, so... Do we tackle those ones? They're closest to the door. Maybe the one at the top. There are some books and paperwork in some of those, so they should be easy enough to sort out. There's one lonely one left on the floor there from the last stack. Let's do that. We might have to move this one, though, or that's going to fall down. So we'll have a look at what's in that, and we'll do that milk crate today. This first box isn't overly interesting. There's a bit of chain and a couple of other things, but we will deal with it today. And the second one, this crate, well... There's something big in the bottom of it. Let's have a look. Okay, the rain's starting to get even heavier, so hopefully it doesn't um, become too annoying. Uh, nice old enamel pie dish on top, and it contains, well, obviously a couple of hinges, uh, a few bolts, some tech screws. In fact, they're the wood ones. I was using some of those when I was building the emergency shower, so I'll certainly keep those. They're handy for fencing jobs. Uh, a couple of hooks. Well, I'll take the hooks to the shop because we use these hooks to hang things off the ladders we have suspended from the ceiling. So there's some useful things. And the bolts and the tech screws I will uh, assign to respective containers around the shed. So no value here, but handy hardware for me. We'll have a better look at the enamel um, dish in a moment. Oh, we have a book. Now, it's not ideal storage for some of these books out in the shed there, but um, I do need to get through them all before anything gets damaged. Um, Backer Cans, Ian Idris, a very popular collectible author from Australia. Uh, most of his books, I believe, were written sort of mid-1900s, maybe a little bit earlier. I think he served in the war from memory, but he, uh, this one's 1958. It is the first edition. Um, but I think a lot of his books were actually earlier than this. I've read most of them. They're actually really good reading. I like his writing style, and it's interesting, his perceptions on developing Australia, and he was involved in uh, mining exploits and had a bit to do with um, the early pastoralists and the opening up of the land, although he wasn't around when the, the um, original explorers were opening up Australia, but he has... Um, some really nice insights into early Australia. Uh, I think I've actually read that one. That's in great condition and being the first edition, it's a shame someone's stuck a plastic sleeve over it and glued it in. But uh, I will check the value of that, but it's quite a nice book. I would expect it to be 20 or $30. Um, but first editions, if they're a rare edition, I don't think this one is. There's quite a few here written here. The Silver City, which was the story of Broken Hill. I've read that one. Men of the Jungle, I've read that. I think that's up in northern Queensland. Uh, the Cattle King was a great one about, great story about Sir Sidney Kidman opening up the centre of Australia with, uh, he bought lots of stations and ran a lot of cattle and sheep. So really interesting story. I have read that one too. 
And the first one that's not listed here I got into was uh, about Lassiter's Reef, um, a supposedly rich gold seam in Central Australia that's never been discovered and whether it's whether it's um, fiction or it really is there and no one since found it, we don't know. But anyway, great book. I'm pleased to find that one. And I'll check a value, but I would say at least, I would say $30 minimum on that. Now, what do we have here? We have a, a manila folder with some papers in it. Now, are they personal papers? Um, it feels a little damp. Oh, it's clippings from the newspapers, but it's not something I've done. <clears throat> 80 mile plane trip to Bendigo. It's quite early cuttings. Oh, that one's 1945, the Bendigo Advertiser. Um, okay, someone has some connection with that. And it might have been the guy that I bought the contents of his shed that was in the RAAF. And he's clipped out uh, the Elmore Standard. Some of his family were from Elmore. Yes, so this probably should go back to the family. It's obviously related to family members. What's this one? Yeah, a marriage notice and wedding bells, another marriage notice. So I do have a folder of paperwork to go back to this the family for this shed lot. And we bought this shed lot. Well, that's been a bit damp. We bought this shed lot a few years ago. So we do find personal effects later on down the track and we always give them back to the family. So there may indeed be more personal stuff in here. What's in this one? Family tree. Okay. Well, if that's the case... Oh no, that's a different family. All right. So that stuff does have to go back to the family, but that's a different deal from the last one. Uh, I remember the surname, and if this is family tree information, it should definitely not be discarded, and we'll give it back to the family. We still have a contact number for them. Uh, that name doesn't ring a bell. I think they've just simply reused a uh, an envelope. But yep, more to be returned. And the big thing in the bottom of this crate looks like perhaps a slide projector. Let's get it out of the crate and hopefully there's no redback spiders underneath it. There we go. Someone pointed out, I think it was Dean pointed out that redback spiders love the little diamond shapes under these milk crates. And I have seen many of them just nesting in the corners. So you do have to be very careful if you're putting your fingers underneath a box to pick it up. Um, most spiders won't bite unless well just about every spider will not bite unless you physically either they feel cornered or threatened or if you half squash them they're going to bite out of reflex um, australia isn't necessarily completely full of things that will kill you uh, there's lots of dangerous things but they don't usually attack or cause any issues unless they're cornered so there you go i'm doing a bit for australian tourism if you want a bit of a laugh, just by the way, there's a comedy duo uh, in Australia, well, I don't know if they're still performing, called The Scared Weird Little Guys, and they did a song called Come to Australia, and if I can link the um, the video to it, it's about 15 years old or so, I'll put it up there. It's only a minute long, bit of a laugh, go and have a look at it. Okay, back to our job at hand. I've just cleaned up the projector, it's actually in pretty good condition. I think it was a pretty good one in its day, and it's just dawned on me that some of you young folk mightn't even know what a slide projector is. And I don't have any slides at the moment, but it was all the rage back when, oh, in the 60s, I think, uh, maybe even the 50s, a lot of photography work produced little square slides that you had to run through a projector, and then you could view them on the wall. And families used to sit around and have slide nights, which were notoriously boring for the young folk. Um, now, if we turn this on, I've got it plugged into my tester. And I'm not sure what screw just fell out of there. I think it's just, I don't know. We'll check that out. Parts are falling off it. But it does work. I'll show you what it does. If we turn it on at the power point there, we have the projector lamp glowing. There's a fan going. There's a remote control. Whoops. And it automatically changes the slide. I don't actually have, I don't have, actually have the long cartridge that goes in here. There's a, a long uh, car oh, it's not a carousel, but it's a cartridge that holds all the slides. And then this mechanism, which operates, it can operate automatically. There's a switch at the back to increase the frequency. And it goes out, takes the slide you've just viewed out, and then puts another one back in for the next viewing. You can adjust the frequency of that, or we can turn it off, and we can actually use the remote. Uh, and I think this button, oh, that button does the focus. 
They're actually a little motor alters the lens in and out to focus and this button does the um, change of slides. So there we go, a slide projector. What's it worth? Um, they're not so useful these days. I think they're collectible and the people that collect them like the, the older ones that look like some sort of uh, alien cannon. Uh, this one, if you've got slides and you can get some cartridges for it to hold them, this is a really good quality machine. Uh, I'm thinking I'll probably put 30 or 40 dollars on it in the shop. It's in good order. I will, um, I will now that I've put it on my tester, I will tag it so that people know it's safe. Uh, but um, you will, of course, have to find the cartridge for it. I don't have them here for it. So uh, there we go, slide projector. Let's go $35 on that one, I reckon. Now, as the rain tumbles down, let's get into this other box. Well, on top looks to be just a kitchen appliance, a vintage one, but it is a Burko, which are a very versatile and very useful kitchen appliance, and it doesn't matter that it's vintage. These things sell very, very well, um, although, weirdly, the cord's been cut off and the plug's left in the socket. It's just a standard um, IEC plug. So we'll test it and make sure it's okay. We'll try another cord in it. I'm not sure why that cord was chopped off. Uh, these things, I think the lid's in here too. It's only a plastic lid. Um, just needs a wash up. These are quite often um, plated copper and they're completely sealed. The heating element's all sealed and they are excellent, not just as a, a water boiling jug like a kettle, but they're essentially like an electric saucepan. So you can have this boiling away and you can you can poach eggs in it, you can drop a can of food in it, you can heat baby's bottles. Very versatile, much more so than a, uh, than a kettle because you can't get a lot of things in a kettle. Uh, this is designed to sit there and bubble away until it boils dry. And then I think they usually have a, some sort of cutout so you don't do any damage to the element. But really versatile items and the ones I've, I used to sell them regularly at $30 and $40 and I just had a quick look on eBay then because I spotted it in here before. And many of them were selling for $60 and $70. So I will clean that up. I will find another plug for it. I'll test it. And it's at least a $50 item. Pretty happy to find that one. What's left in our tub here? Well, I told you we had some chain, just random chain. I think this might have been stuff that I used to um, tie things up out the front of my old shop to the veranda posts. Uh, I will keep it here for now because I'm going to need various chain for things. Some of it might go to the shop for the same purpose, for tying stuff out, up out the front. Uh, but I do have to hang some lights and things in the shed. Probably a bit heavy duty for that, but I do have a bucket of chain, so I'll hang on to that for the moment. And there's a much older bit here. Uh, very rusty, but clean enough to handle. It's not dirty. Really nice old links. And it even changes to a different different pitch chain there. Uh, and I sell a lot of this sort of old chain. And I've been picking up bits from the farm. This one's actually got a tag on it. And it was in the shop for $5. I don't know why it ended up in here. But um, we'll certainly get $5 for that. People love it to hang in there. Uh, in their ferneries for hanging pots, pot plants off and that sort of stuff. Okay, a bit of a mixed bag. What's in the left, in the rest of this bucket? We have some old jars or bottles. A nice old purple jar. We have a little essence bottle. And another little, probably a perfume, that one. It's got a big chip off the front. Uh, I don't know why these ended up in this box. I possibly had these on the roof of my shed at the shop, at the old shop, uh, because they turn purple in the sun. They haven't got so much of a tint to them, but this one certainly has. Um, so they're, they're probably pre-1920s, they're early 1900s bottles, uh, and it's manganese, uh, manganese dioxide in the glass mix that reacts with the UV rays, and they will turn purple. Um, so that one's going to actually clean up quite well. We'll give that a wash up. We'll get $5 for that. Not sure if we'll get five for either of those. And I couldn't, that one's got a big chip, as I said. So it's probably not, we might just put that in the free box at the shop and someone might like it. And same with that one, someone can wash it up. I'm not 
going to, they're really hard to wash up those, it's hard to get a bottle brush in there. Uh, but that one's well worth it and it's a nice purple colour so we'll get five for that and those two will be giveaways. Uh, a piece of angle line here that I think I had welded to a fence post at the back of my old shop to support the post so that's only going to go in the heavy scrap bin. Uh, a couple of scrapers here or one scraper, an old file, a ring spanner, might have had a bit of moisture in the bottom of this at one stage, it is a Sid Chrome one, half inch 916 ring spanner. I'll give that a quick clean up. We'll possibly get $5 for that. It's a handy size. Uh, and we have, what is this? A little electric motor. It looks like it's from a cassette player because there's a, a little uh, playback head on there. They can just go in our electric motor scrap. So that's the end of this box. I'd say this one was near the shed at my old shop where I was doing a lot of scrapping. Hence the tools probably dropped in there and this might have ricocheted from around the yard after being freed loose with a hammer or something. But that finishes this tub. We'll clean up a few things and I'll get back to you with a notepad shortly. Time now to wind up the value of this little unboxing and to check the notepad. Let's just scan through our stuff first. A uh, little bit of hardware that I'm going to keep here as mentioned. So I haven't written down any value for that. Also the few things I'm going to put in the shop in the dollar box. I'm not going to value that either. The hinges I'll probably keep here because I think I do have a job for those. And the hooks will go to the shop. So useful stuff. No rubbish. No scrap metal. Um, but we're not writing down any value. Now, the old enamel pie dish, I was going to talk to you a little bit about this. It's a nice early one, and you can pick the early enamel wear because there's no logo on the bottom. Uh, most of the stuff you see from the 80s, around the 80s and 90s, had made in China uh, a circle stamp on it. Uh, it may not be marked now again either, but you can tell the wear to that one, and you can feel the weight. It's easy to pick original enamel wear from the weight they used a much heavier gauge steel uh, this one's pretty rough as you can see the enamel's obviously chipped and and crazed it has rusted and it's stained but even so i'm still going to put five dollars on it in the shop because it's a nice early piece of enamel wear someone will use it for something it'd make maybe a nice um dog's dish or i know my mum used some enamel wear in the chook pens um but even in the kitchen, it might make a nice rustic looking fruit bowl. It's the classic uh, white with the blue trim, even though there's not a lot of the blue left. You also get the, uh, the color combination of cream and green, which is popular as well. But even though that's so rough, because it's a nice early solid piece of enamel wear, we'll get $5 for that. The book, I've pretty well talked about the book enough. I've did a bit of checking. I think 30 is a good price for that. The, um, the projector, again, we've talked enough about that. I did find some online where some sellers were asking about $80, but they weren't selling. Mind you, postage would be expensive. Uh, if I did have the cartridge uh, for it, I would probably ask a bit more, but it's been tested and tagged now as well. So 35 maybe, I think I said on that one. The, um, the little jar cleaned up well. We washed that up. It's a really nice amethyst color, naturally colored in the sun. Possibly a meat paste jar or something along those lines. And I would say around between 1910 to 1920. So $5 easy on that one. I may even have a lid. I would have a, a tub of old lids at the shop. A nice Bakelite lid would certainly up the value. would probably go 10 then, but I'll put five on it. Now, the Burko, I gave a clean up. It looks magnificent. Uh, I haven't been able to test it, though, because the plug isn't a standard um standard IEC plug it's got a notch at the bottom so I tried to plug a normal one in and because there's a whoops we nearly lost the lid because that little notch things at the bottom there it won't go in I can test the pins easily to make sure the elements okay and test the earth one to make sure it's earthing to the case I'm sure it will be fine I have never ever had one of those burkos that did not work and did not test safely they're so well made so I'm going to put $55 on that. I think I have a cord at the shop for it anyway. Uh, the other thing to check on that is if we are replacing cords on these things, we do have to be aware of what power they draw. Now this one says 240 volts, 700 watts. So if we do a little bit of mathematics, because this cord, I found the other cord that I was going to use was rated at 10 amps. Um, now power equals voltage by current. And we need to know what sort of current the cord can handle because all cords are actually marked uh, with a figure 
this one will be somewhere. Um, so we need, uh, so we know the power is 400, uh, sorry, 700, 700 watts, and the voltage is 240 by the current, and just by the mathematical swapping things around, the current is going to equal 700 divided by 240, which is what, um, 486, 720, so just under 3 amps, around about 2.9 amps. The item draws so any power cord that's rated at about 10 amps which most of them are is going to be perfectly safe for that and as i said i think i've got some old cords at the shop as long as they're safe uh, as far as the insulation goes we're good to go so there we go our total i you probably saw it when i picked the pen up 140 dollars not bad from a couple of boxes of next to nothings so uh more good value out of the emergency storage shed so thanks for watching guys, another episode of this series complete. Before I go, a few of you have mentioned, wouldn't it be great to have a running tally of how much value we're getting out of the shed? Well, especially for you guys, I've been back through the last few videos, looked at the notebook stage, which I think I've done on every one of them or most of them, and we've got a total. Now I'm only really pricing the stuff that I'm taking to the shop, I'm not pricing stuff that I'm keeping here. And so far out of 16 or uh, 17 parts plus today 18 parts we're at two thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars of what i've dragged out of that shed and as you've seen we've only really just got a little space in the doorway so who knows what else we're going to find i think there is some stuff in there that should be pretty valuable there will probably be some boxes that don't make the hundred dollars but we've been going pretty good lately so there you go we'll keep a running total and i'll report it on it at the end of each episode. Thanks for watching. Catch you in the next video. Bye for now.